may or may not know that, that we, we give scholarships here for God's glory ministry. Amen. We are small but mighty here for God's glory ministry. Amen. People come to us for scholarships that come from churches a hundred times bigger than us that don't give scholarships. Amen? Amen. So we are grateful that God trusts us to use what we bring to the storehouse to give it out to show God's love. And Natalie was one of our very first, our first class of scholarship recipients when we started the program. She was one of them. And I remember Amen. reading her uh, her letter of intent, her, her letter of purpose. Amen. I still remember it all those years ago. And to Amen. God be the glory. Amen. Amen. So we are so glad that she's here. It's a reminder of our purpose, a reminder of the impact that we want to make. Amen. Amen. I also want to mention uh, Nina and Marlo. I saw you out there last week. I said I wanted some of you all that hadn't commented. I need to know you're out there, and you did it for me. So thank you so much, Nina and Marlo. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah for commenting. Now, we're still learning. Uh, as Pastor Trina said, we are still in the book of Revelation. Is that all right? Amen. Are you guys learning something from Amen. the book of Revelation? Amen. Amen. It's not so mysterious, is it? Amen. No, we can learn from it. It's telling us about the future. Why does it matter? Does it matter because we'll be there and we need to know? Well, in some cases, yes. But it also matters so that we can do things like put the coronavirus, COVID-19, into perspective. What does it really mean? Right. And what we're finding out is that the things that you see in the book of Revelation, for real, with all those seals being opened, wow. it's a lot bigger than the coronavirus vaccine. Excuse me, not vaccine, the coronavirus illness. Amen? Amen. It's a lot bigger. So, no, this is not one of those uh, torturous things that man's going to go through uh, as, as a part of God's judgment at the end of days. Amen? No, 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 no. It's here to set the stage. Amen. It's here to help us begin. It's here. It's not even about the illness itself. Wow. It's about all the things that are turning in the background, all the policies that are going to be changed, mm -hmm. all of the enablements that will be changed. And don't forget about our president. Come on, now, there's many things happening to set yeah. the stage for the end. And I'm talking about our prior president, who's right. still hanging around. Amen? Right. He hasn't gone anywhere. Right. He's not in office, but he's still on the scene, isn't he? Right. He's having more impact on Congress today than anybody else. Yeah. Amen? Am I right? Yeah. Hallelujah. Those congressmen, they want, they're scared to vote the way they really think. Right. <laughs> because he's still on the scene. What am I trying to say? I'm not trying to be political. I'm trying to tell you that it was President Trump's time. Right. And he did what he, what he was supposed to do. And he's still having the impact he was supposed to have. Is it all good for us? No, no, it's not all good. But it's time. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm just saying. We're learning from the book of Revelation. We're learning about the end. And as we learn about this book that only Jesus was worthy of opening. That book had seven seals, did it not? Yes. And we've gone through how many of those seals? Yeah. We've learned about how many of those seals? Six, yeah, million. six plus, right? Million. Very good, six plus. Because we are now on that seventh seal. We're at the end, just like the book of Revelation. We're at the end of that book. Mm -hmm. And those seven seals... And why are they seals? For those of you who may be here for the first time, in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament, in the old time days, they had a scroll, and, you had, and it was sealed up. So you remove the seals to reveal more of the book, the scroll. Mm -hmm. And so we're at the scroll is being open and open and open, and now we get to the last portion. The last seal could be broken. And upon the opening of that last seal, we saw that there were now seven angels in this last seal. And those seven angels each had a trumpet, and each one, as they would blow their trumpet, end times events were revealed. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so what we learned last week was about the first four trumpets. Mm -hmm. The first four. Amen? Amen? And as those trumpets were blown, we had disastrous events, all which impacted nature directly and man indirectly. Amen? Amen. Man wasn't touched directly. No nature affected the salt water and the sea creatures. No nature was affected in terms of the crop of growing ability. No nature was affected in terms of the sun's ability to shine and the moon's ability to shine and the star's ability to shine. Nature was affected through the impact on the fresh water, 
that we drink. And we saw fractions of people. And I don't mean small fractions. I mean a third. Did you hear a third a few times? Amen. A third of the trees were burned up. A third of people died from drinking the water. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And so the other thing that we know about this, not only are these things allowing us to put COVID-19 into perspective, but we're also learning that while these things may seem so disastrous, so terrible, so ominous, to understand that this is not God coming to punish and judge mankind. It's not some angry God just trying to punish mankind because he can't. No, no, no. This is God's retribution against those at the time mm -hmm. who do deserve it, who have either turned their back and made their, themselves enemies of him or punished God's people, harmed God's people, God's people who were on earth, who were martyred. He is letting them know, I've got your back. We want to put Revelation in its proper perspective because otherwise you make stuff up. And the problem isn't that you make stuff up about Revelation. It's the problem is you make stuff, stuff up about God. How many of you knew, if you ever tried to read all these words and all the strange symbolism, that if you pay attention, what it is, is God bringing down his judgment on people who dare to harm those who love him, right. who right. dare to harm those who worship mm -hmm. him, who dare Amen. to harm, harm those who have committed to him. Why do, you, why do you need to, you need to know that God cares about you that much. Amen. Would you protect your child if somebody hurt them? Mm -hmm. Would you? How far would you go? How mad would you get? What kind of things would you do? Could you even withhold your rage if somebody's harming your child and you can do Amen. something about it? God feels the same way about you. Amen. Amen. Think about this. You look at Revelation, you think, oh, all these end times events. Well, it's woven through all of this book. It's not only God's plan, but God's love. Amen. You find God's love even in the book of Revelation. Did you know that? Yeah. Even with all the symbolism, even with all the amazing things happening, you find God's love. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 8. Our text will be in chapter 9 this week. We finished up chapter 8 last week, but the reason I want to go there is because I want to take a look at verse 13, the very last verse. Because we said we covered the first four trumpets, did we not? The first four angels, mm -hmm. the first four trumpets, and the first four pieces of judgment that God took out on the people who were here on earth. Amen? Amen. But we also likened this judgment, these punishments, to the book of Job. Right. Where when Job was harmed, when God allowed Satan to harm Job, the first, the first portion of that harm came in direct towards his wealth, towards his family. Never touching Job. Never let him touch. He said, okay, you can do all, you can touch everything that's his, but you can't touch him. The same thing was true in the first four trumpets. But when we get to chapter 8, verse 13, John writes, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, what does it say? Whoa. I can't hear you. Whoa. 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 Amen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. To the inhabitants of the earth. Who are we talking about? These people who are still here, who have turned their backs on God, who were either directly involved or complicit in the harming of God's people in the last days. Whoa, whoa, whoa. To the inhabitants of the earth. By reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which have not are not, which are yet to sound. So those last three. They're not just the last three angels and the last three trumpets. We're actually talking about woe, woe meaning look out, look out, look out. If you think the first four was something, you just wait until the last three. And we talked about the fact that in biblical terms, if somebody says something twice in a row, it is for definite emphasis. If they say it three times, forget about it. And so it also represents that those last three trumpets, each one of them represents a whoa, amen? Something ominous is about to happen. And that means it's going to be worse, it's going to be different than the first four, or both. 
It's going to be worse than the first four. It's going to be different from the first four or both. Amen? Amen. Are you ready for some woes this morning? Mm. Amen. Amen. What are we still remember what we're talking about? If you hurt somebody that belongs to me, if you hurt somebody that give it, has given their life for God, if you hurt them, whoa, you better look out. Right. Are you ready to find out what God's going to bring on those yeah. who would hurt his people? Yeah. Are you ready for the woes? Amen. Are you ready? I don't mean to live through the woes. I hope you don't have to live through the woes. But are you ready to understand? How much God loves his people. How, how much he rewards their patience and waiting for him to stand up for them. Waiting because it looked like they were losing. Do you ever have a situation? Do you feel like right now you, you're losing? Do you feel like, you know, Satan has the upper hand? Do you feel like you're on the losing side? I, this is here to help you know you will not lose in the end. Right. If you love God. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you Hallelujah. ready for some woes? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Today, as we go to chapter 9, we're going to be paying attention to trumpets numbers 5 and 6, which represent woes number 1 and 2. We won't get to the third one. There's not, it won't be time. Amen? Amen? But we are going to understand what happens when the angel of heaven says, whoa, whoa, whoa. You think those first four were something? You think it was something for something to crash down to the earth and, and to poison all of the fresh water? You think it was something for something to come down to the earth and kill one-third of all the fish in the sea, one-third to, to, to capsize one-third of the ships in the ocean? You think it was something for people to kill, kill each other and kill one-third of human beings? You think that was something? For that to happen once, amen? amen. <laughs> Our goal is to demystify these things. The book of Revelation is not just for theologians, it's not just for pastors, it's not just for those that have gone to seminary. It's, it's for everyone. This book is yours. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to digest and understand and know what meant is meant in the book of Revelation. Amen? amen. My goal is to demystify it for you. Amen? amen. Hallelujah. So let's go to chapter 9 of this book and I'll read verse 1 and the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth now I'm going to stop there I didn't finish it but why did I stop there I stopped there because doesn't that sound familiar we had meteorites essentially what we know will be meteorites coming to the earth a lot in the first four seals did we not Amen. And I, I remind you all why this is so important for us to understand end times. If you pay attention to movies and books and things, you often see the theme being a meteorite coming toward Earth and man mustering all of his know-how to do something about it. And the fact that we are doing everything in our power and with our resources and our finances to find another planet to live on. That's not just curiosity. I don't know if y'all hear me. Amen. But I'm going to say it a few more times just so it sinks in. So that the next time you watch a movie, the next time you watch SpaceX going up in the air, the next time they have the Mars probes and they seem so desperate to find life elsewhere, but not just to find it because they want to find a way that we can live elsewhere. Those with the wherewithal, by the way. If the earth was so wonderful and if it wasn't going to be in trouble, they'd be finding a way to send you somewhere else and all the wealthy people would get to stay here. That's not how it's going to work. If they find another place, it will be the wealthy ones that will go. Mm -hmm. And you'll be here because they know this is not the place to be. They know. They're not ignorant. They just choose to live by secular humanism as opposed to the Bible. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So I wanted to point it out because it sounds like the fifth trumpet is just like the first four. But we have to keep reading. So it says, I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to, what does that next word say? Him. Him. Not it. Him. And to him was given the key of what? The bottomless pit. pit. Uh-oh. So, uh-oh. These, these woes are different, aren't they? These woes are different. I know they are. They are not the same. It may seem like in the beginning, but if you keep reading, you will see that he gave to him the keys to the bottomless pit. So now, 
we're starting to see something a little bit more demonic and spiritual here, bottomless pit. Oh my God, we, we, it was one thing for things to fall to the earth. It was one thing to have a super volcano. It was one thing for natural things to happen, but now we're talking about supernatural, not just things, but beings mm -hmm. gave to him the keys to the bottomless pit. So now we have a him, not just an it coming down to the earth. And we also have the bottomless pit and the key. Amen? Amen. Let's look at verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great what? Furnace. Furnace. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Does that remind you of anything? Yeah. And the sun and the air were what? Dark. Darkened. Darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. I told you about how those things can happen. That's how they say the dinosaurs went away. Wow. You have a meteorite, bam, and all the dust that goes up in the mid blocks the sun, and then you have the freezing of the earth or the temperatures going so low that they couldn't live. Vegetation couldn't be there for them to eat. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. And so the vegetarian uh, dinosaurs, if, if they really exist, then they die, and then the carnivore dinosaurs couldn't eat the vegetarian dinosaurs, and so then they disappeared. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What we're just talking about is these, these phenomena are totally understandable. Amen? Amen? So, the air was darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given what? Power. power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they, what does it say? Should not hurt the grass, like it was hurt before. Remember all the grass was burned up of the earth. Neither any green thing, unlike the first four trumpets. Neither any tree, just like that first trumpet, right? But only who? Those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, you know, when we started this thing, we saw that there was quiet in heaven. Mm -hmm. Everything stopped for a half an hour, and there was a seal put on that was 144,000 that God said, we're about to break some stuff that you don't want to have to deal with, and I'm going to make sure those of mine who are left here will not be touched, so they're going to be sealed. Amen? Amen. Amen. And now we see this bottomless pit where evil spirits dwell. Amen? Amen. They are trapped there. They are locked there until the appropriate time. And so they have released for this occasion to accomplish God's will. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So now we have here locusts that are going to have power to harm man. Not the green things, but to harm actual man. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. Now locusts can fly, right? Amen. Can scorpions fly? No. Mm -hmm. Scorpions can sting, right? Yeah. Can locusts sting? No. But this is a whole new thing in a whole new time. You're going to have something with the characteristics of both. So they can fly and find you, get to where you are, and then they can sting you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. They're not going to be here to eat up crop. They're going to be here to do God's will in a different way because we're not, crop would be indirect damage or harm to man or judgment to man. This is now about direct. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go to verses 5 and 6. And to them it was given, wow, that they should do what? Kill. Not kill them. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be able to sting them, but to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be what? Tormented. Tormented for how long? Five months. Five months. And their torment would have, was as the torment of a scorpion. Now, most scorpion stings will not kill a man. But there are some scorpions. Many of them can kill, kill a child. But there are some scorpions that actually can kill a man. And some of them do exist in the, in the Middle East. Now, this will not just be in the Middle East. But this was a Middle Eastern context that, that, that this, this was written in. So their understanding was it, oh my God, scorpions can be pretty tough. Occasionally a man can die from a scorpion sting, but we're talking about a scorpion that can fly like a locust? Now we're really in trouble, amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. So it says, for five months they will be tormented, and their torment 
was as the torment of what? A scorpion when he strikes a man. And in those days shall men what? Seek death. And shall not find it. Shall desire to die. And death shall flee from them. So in addition to the spiritual aspect of things and the fact that it's not just nature is being affected, but man directly being affected, what we see here is this pain. We're talking about how much God is upset about these people hurting his people. So we had all this natural stuff, and now it's direct. And now you have these things that can fly and probably look like locusts, but can sting so they can get to you. And they can sting like a scorpion. Scorpion stings, even when they don't kill you, they hurt a lot. Mm -hmm. They hurt a lot. But I want you to imagine this. We said, whoa, what's so big about a whoa? Well, now you got a bottomless pit. Now you have demonic characters, right? Yeah. Now you have something that's going directly toward man. And if you don't think this is a woe to you, if you don't think this is worthy of a woe, I want you to imagine the worst pain you've ever felt or the worst pain you can imagine feeling. And I want you to imagine that pain ah, for five seconds. Now I want you to imagine enduring that pain for five minutes. Mm. Imagine that severity of pain for five hours. Mm. Imagine that severity of pain for five days. Women are made so that they can endure labor pains. But you try having labor for five days, they won't even let you go through labor for five days. I don't know. <laughs> and if you think five days is something, how about five weeks? Can you imagine having excruciating pain? Pain that makes you wish you could just die. Just kill me. Kill me. Mm. Imagine for five weeks how much mm. torment that would be. This is the measure of God's anger toward those who would hurt you, which is the equivalent of God's love for us. I know it sounds twisted, but when if you were to go upside the head of somebody who was hurting your child, that would be love more than hate. So it's his love for us and his appreciation for us that keeps him from continuing to have mercy on those who would Harm his people. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're learning. I know this is not a shouting type of message, but we are learning here Amen. what the book of Revelation wants us to learn. Amen? Amen? So if you could imagine that excruciating, intolerable, I just want to die. Just shoot me in the head, but death won't come. Pain for five weeks. Try it for five whole months. Mm. Five whole months of excruciating, intolerable, unimaginable pain. This is not going to let up, by the way. This pain isn't going to come and go. It's going to be constant. Just like the constancy of the hatred toward God's people at the end of time as they lift God up and man wants to be lifted up and the Antichrist system is in place. They're not going to tolerate you worshiping just like they didn't tolerate Daniel praying to his God. Right. Mm -hmm. Just like they didn't want Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to fail to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's image. It's going to be just like that. Amen? Amen. Amen. So five months, that's absolutely mind-blowing. That is torment. Can you just imagine? Think about it. Amen? Amen? So now that we know about this fifth trumpet and the first woe, I'm going to look at these next few verses. I really I almost don't want to, but I feel like I need to just to expose you. But what we've just learned up to this point about God's love, being manifested in punishing those who harmed his people and how much torment that would be involved in five months of excruciating pain. That's the thing that you need to know about this, this seal, about the fifth seal. That's it. We can stop right there. But that's not the part that gets the most attention. That's not the part that sparks all the debate. We're going to see that in verses 7 through about 11. And I, what I want you to know is while, yes, it's in the Bible, so yes, it's important, it is also a distraction to almost everyone who reads it. 
It's a distraction. Because I just told you everything you need to know. The end of days. God's people stand up for him. God's people give their lives or are tormented, in many cases, give their lives. God decides eventually, okay, I'm going to finally rectify this. I'm going to finally stand up for you. I'm going to finally punish them. And he starts those seals open up, and he's not punishing them. And we get to this particular seal, or this particular trumpet uh, of the seventh seal, and we see what happened. That God's, the people who are God's enemy, or the enemy of God's people, are harmed by these Objects, these locusts that can sting like a scorpion and they have pain for five months. That's the punishment and that's the reason and that's the context and that's all you actually need to know. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to read 7 through 11. So that you can see what all the hubbub is about, what people write books about and they confuse everybody and they argue and say, no it's this and no it's that and no it's this. This is what we're going to read here. But you will never, ever again get distracted by it. You will never ever again get confused by it. You will never ever get thrown off by it and fail to know what God really wants you to know. Verse 7. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. So, so those who want to make this into something that is not, start saying, oh, it's not really locusts that sting like scorpions, that can fly like a locust and sting like a scorpion. No, actually what he was really saying is he didn't understand. It's really a battle. These are really army men, amen, and women. Amen. And so the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. See, this is why people go there. And there's all this debate. And they had hair like the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. So you start picturing all this amazing imagery. Why did it look like that? Don't know. What did it mean? What, 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 was he talking about an army? I don't think so. When you talk about the sting and somebody hurting for five months, now, it's possible. It's possible. That these things that he's seeing that he's trying to understand are some kind of an end times drone that can travel through the air and that can shoot a dart into somebody that was something that'll hurt them for five months. That's certainly possible. But that's on the extremes. Amen? Amen. So hair like women and teeth like lions, and they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails. And their power was to what? Hurt men for five months. So what's important there? Was it important John's attempts to describe them and what they looked like to him? Or the fact that they were manifestations of God's judgment? And that judgment would be that they would hurt men and cause them to have pain for five months. And why he did it was because he loved those that sacrificed for him. Amen. No need, no benefit to be distracted by trying to figure out why John described them that way. Even if it turns out to be some army that he saw as locusts that could sting like a scorpion. What really matters is why God did it, who he did it to. And what he actually did. Amen? Amen? That's what really matters. I'm just trying to make sure that we get it. Amen? Amen. And it may have, you may have a hard time imagining the locust and, and the scorpion stuff, but let me just tell you, 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 have, you might have had a hard time imagining COVID 19 until it came. Amen. Amen? Amen. The bottom line is that we have a punishment from God. It's directly toward man, not indirect this time. Obvious demonic connection and prolonged torturous pain. Let's go to verse 12. We're getting close. Now it says there, one woe is past. One woe is now past, and there comes now two more woes. Can you handle one more woe this morning? Do you want to hear about the second one? Was the one woe pretty tough? Mm -hmm. I want you to imagine that pain. I want you to imagine how long. I want you to imagine these things coming at you. I know that they were scared, or they're going to be scared. So one world was passed, and we want to just cover one more world this morning. Amen? Amen. We're going to talk about the sixth trumpet, the second woe. And we're still going to have an effect directly on man. We're still going to have obvious spiritual influence here and activity. But there's going to be something different here, just the opposite. We're going to flip the script. There's really, there really is a human army this time. 
This time, it's not just a locust that can sting like a scorpion. This time, there's no confusion about whether there's a human army. This time, there will be a human army. Let's go to verse 13. And so the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And you all know what that is because we've been paying attention. Saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose or let go the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So now you have some placement. Now you know exactly where they're talking about. Euphrates River, essentially you're talking about the, the, the country we call Iraq. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to what? To slay. Slay how many? A third. One third of men. Does that sound familiar? Yes, sir. Does the one third sound familiar? Yes, and the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand. And I heard the number of them. So he heard the number of them, which means it was an actual number. This time it's not just hyperbole. This time, sometimes he just said, they just say things to try to tell you it's more than anybody could count. But in this case, there's actually a number that he heard. And I want you to pay attention here. We're talking about these angels being bound, held there at the river Euphrates, in the, in, obviously in the Middle East. But I want you to pay attention to the precision. They have been bound there, waiting to do God's bidding. And they've been waiting, not just for a year that it might happen, not just for a month that it was going to happen in, not just for a day that it would happen in, but literally down to the hour. They knew when that time was likely to come. They had to wait. They were waiting. They knew there would come a precise time. And they've been waiting for that precise time for them to do what they were supposed to do in the end days. Amen? Amen. And if you count the 200,000 thousand, that comes to 200 million. So there will be an army probably amassed or originating from this portion of the Middle East. Maybe it won't. Maybe, maybe that's not what the Euphrates River is about. Maybe the angels are just bound there, but maybe the army will come from somewhere else. But it will certainly be amassed. And I want you to understand, they're going to be amassed almost certainly with, with hatred toward Israel. But remember, the 144,000 can't be touched. So it's actually going to harm the rest of those who are not with God. You're going to get where I'm going in just a second. Amen? So let's notice that one third of mankind that is killed at this time by a human army. Now, if you look at verses 17 through 19 here, what you're going to see is more confusing imagery. I'm not going to put you through it. I just showed you the first time that it doesn't add to you. It just tells you what he thought he saw, but it doesn't change what really happened or why and who it was going to happen to and who it wasn't going to happen to, like the 144,000. Amen? Amen? So 7 through 19, I'm not going to take you through that. It triggers all kinds of debate, but it doesn't add to you. Amen? Amen. Just as, you know, uh, if you look at those verses, it's really John's best description of what he's probably trying to describe is modern day end times war machines. Amen? War, war implements. Amen? Amen? And so we have mankind harming mankind. The people who stand with the Antichrist and against God and hurt God's people, God's going to use those very people against themselves. And one third will, be, will die, right? Amen? So let's go to verses 20 and 21 because in the end, when it comes to this sixth trumpet, that's what really matters. God is going to use the demonic powers to harm those that actually stand with and for the demonic powers. Amen? Amen. So let's look at verses 20 and 21 because ultimately this is what matters. And the rest 
of the men, many people, which were not killed by these plagues. What does it say next? Yet, repented, Yet not. repented not. I want you to think about all the things that have happened up to this point. I want you to think about folks dying of starvation because they can't because they can't eat the food because there's not enough food. I want you to think about the fact that the sun doesn't shine so that the plants can't grow. I want you to think about people dying from the water being poisoned. I want you to think about wars and a third of the humanity dying and now another third of whatever was left dying as man uh, goes against man. I want you to think about people being hurt for five whole months in a row because they stand against God and harm God's people. Think about all of that and what he said saying here is those who are left, those who haven't been killed yet by these plagues, still did not repent. Mm. Wow. They did not repent of the work of their hands, that they should not worship devils mm. and idols of gold mm. and silver and brass and stone mm. and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor talk. And if that sounds odd to you, in the Antichrist system, you will have to do that. Neither repented they or, excuse me, of their murders, nor of their sorcery, sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. They still will not repent. So I want you to, why does that matter? As we take in this era that we're living in, and we have the coronavirus, which is one of the biggest once in a lifetime, really once in a century event, and we see society shutting down, people having to wear masks. It was like a ghost town for a while. People telling you where you can go, when you can go, in a society where that's not the norm. All of these things happening. Oh my God, is this the end times event? No. <laughs> you see what it's like when we have a real end time event. The coronavirus doesn't even touch what's going to happen in the end. Amen? But you start to see that things that you've never seen in your life can happen. But despite those things happening, now you are not surprised, if you were surprised, why people did not flock to church. You would think, oh my goodness, you know, the coronavirus proves that things can happen that you can't imagine can happen. Truly, this must be the end times. I'm telling you, it's just setting up the end times. I'm telling you, it's just the beginning of the end times. It's not this revelation stuff with all these things that we're now reading about in the seal. No, 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 no. But for something that is our closest equivalent so far, we shouldn't be surprised that people aren't flocking to God. We shouldn't be surprised that people aren't repenting and saying, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, my bad. We shouldn't be surprised because it's going to be 10 times, 100 times worse. And they're not going to repent. So don't be surprised. Any preacher that gets up to any pulpit and tells you that in the end times, what's going to happen is a big old revival and the church is going to get bigger. There's going to be more mega churches. If there are more mega churches, they are false churches led by false prophets. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Come on. This is not a time when the overall church enlarges and gets better. Only the remnant remains pure. Only the remnant remains true. Only those who know exactly whose time it is. So everybody that preaches to you that it's man's time, it's all about you, houses, cars, lands, your body, even our health. Our health, the only reason to have it is to raise our children and take our care of our responsibilities and to live for God. If you think your health is for some other reason, at this time, you're missing it. You're missing it. Hallelujah. So what do we learn from these two woes? We learn, we learn that God is going to use spiritual forces that are aligned against him and against his people. And he's going to turn it on, on itself. Amen? Amen. 
Amen. He's going to let Satan and his emissaries do his bidding, and they will happily do so. Those spirits that are locked up, they're going to be happy to get out for a minute. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But none of the 144,000 will be harmed. So guess what? After the bottomless pit and the key, after all the satanic forces, all the strange insects, army killing one third of all people, believe it or not, in the sixth trumpet and the second woe, there's actually more. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. Oh, when he said woe, woe, he meant woe, woe, and woe. We're not even done with the second woe. We're not even done. There's more. The second one was so deep and so heavy, it's going to blow your mind. We've already heard some stuff. Is it, I mean, is, is, it, is it something pretty big for a third of people to die? Yeah. Is it something, is, is, isn't it really something for there to be demonic forces manifesting? That, isn't it something for something that looks like a locust but acts like a scorpion to cause men to hurt for five months? Isn't it something? Wouldn't you call that a woe? Mm -hmm. Not even done with the second one. So stay tuned. <laughs> Next week, we're going to find out about what's going to happen in the rest of that second one. And my prayer, my hope, my goal, my intention is for you to understand what God wants you to understand here in the book of Revelation. And I, I, I believe that every single person listening to me understands what I just said. Mm -hmm. You understand it as well as any theologian walking among us. You understand exactly what God wanted us to hear. Mm -hmm. Amen. You understand God's role. You understand man. You understand who got hurt. You understand who did the hurting. You understand what's going to happen to them. You understand how long it's going to happen to them. You understand the why. Because of God's love for his people. Mm -hmm. And yes, you will do harm to those who hurt those that love you, that, hurt, that, 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 that love you and belong to you. You will. <laughs> Instinctively. Amen? Amen. Amen? So next week, we're going to finish the sixth trumpet in the second woe. And there'll be one woe left, the seventh. Uh, the, the, the third woe in the seventh uh, trumpet. And you might even, you might, you might, are you coming next week? Are you ready? Are you, are you, are you looking forward to next week? Amen. You, you might even find out why 5G matters. You might even find out why 5G technology and things like that actually matter in the end days. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Are you coming next week? Amen. Are you watching next week? Amen. Are we learning from the book of Revelation? Amen. Is it all mysterious and only special people can understand it? No. Was it written to only them and not to all of God's people? No. My job is to make it so that we're all leaders, that we all have something to say, we all have something to teach, that we can also each one teach one, and so we can bless one and many. Amen. For God's Glory. Let's give God a hand for this.